All righty. We are back with the Pursuit of Ownership. We have another pre-owner underwater, and I am very privileged to have our very own uh, George Hariri with us. And we have a practice, um, well, a potential practice that we're going to be looking at here um, with our guest who has not decided his name yet. And I'm really hoping he thought of something interesting in the last 15 seconds. What do you got? Tapatio. 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 Oh, I love it. Name it after the hot sauce. Oh, I'm all about <laughs> that name. Yes. Let's get well, some interesting I'm... names on the show. We have Tapatio here, Dr. Tapatio, yeah. our guest. Oh, yeah. man, what a great name. I'm going to yeah, love this I was, episode. I was expecting a superhero, so he really threw no, me No, you know, I, I heard Iron Man and Batman. I didn't want to, I mean, I could, I was going to go with Thanos, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. Tapatio is where it's at. No, no. We're stuck oh, yeah. on Tapatio. Yeah, Thanos. that's where you put, you know, flavorless food. You just dump the Tapatio right. on there and then boom, there you go. Just um, keep it on you in the back so pocket. I am excited for today's episode. This is right up my wheelhouse. Um, I've looked at the financials and I saw collections were high. So uh, that is Maybe. that is my kind of practice here. We're talking about a big office. Um, yeah. So, I mean, before we jump right into the practice, which is what I'd like to do, um, maybe Tyler, do you have the questions that you typically ask these, uh, lovely pre-owners underwater before we get into the practice? Yeah. You know, I always like to establish a context. Um, you know, Tapatio, if you could kind of just give us a quick run through on where you're coming from and you know, why this opportunity is interesting you. Yeah. So graduated about three years ago, always knew I wanted to get into ownership. Um, you know, worked in private practice for a short amount of time. And then an opportunity to work rural and make more money came up. And I was here and all the doctors here were like, oh, rural is where it's at. And you always hear rural is where it's at. So I was really looking for a practice here for quite a long time. But I, I kind of found that because it's rural, there's not a lot of practices that really seemed appealing to me. Um, so I kind of cast my net a little wider. And um, right before COVID happened, I happened to find this, this uh, unique opportunity because my fiance is also a dentist. So the practice we're looking at today, it's basically two doctors working out of one location. Um, so it's, I don't know if they have some kind of agreement where they have to sell at the same time, but but they both happen to be for sale at the same time. Um, so it's kind of like buying a group practice, but it's like a two for one type of thing. Right. So they're in the same building. Is there a partition or what is that? No, no they, it, it, if you walked in, you wouldn't think it was two separate practices. Um, I guess it was there initially they, a long time ago, there were three partners, one, I don't know, maybe they bought him out, phased him out. And then there was two. And then about four years ago, one of the partners sold to a younger female doctor. Um, and her husband actually owned a practice across the street, which is by the numbers looks really small. Um, and they kind of merged that together. And then the other male doctor who was one of the original partners, he's selling to retire and she's selling because she says she has some family issues that she's been dealing with. And we'll, as you guys probably saw, there's kind of that decline in revenue by about 100000 or so every year since she bought the practice. Okay. All right. So. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and is there some staff overlap there with it being in the same building or how? <laughs> yeah. So they, they do share some staff. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if you saw her, she only has two full-time staff and a lot of part-time staff. Um, mm -hmm. They keep their own front desk. Um, as far I did, they have the names crossed out, so I don't know exactly, you know, okay. which staff specifically. Um, so, yeah, fair enough. And um, I have to ask, how did you come across this opportunity? How did it come up? You know, I actually found this on one of the local broker websites. Okay. So I was kind of surprised um, to see what I thought was a good opportunity. Uh, maybe you guys have different opinions. You know, that's why we're here to talk. Is you know. But I thought maybe one of the reasons why it has been on the market, I know it's been at least over a year, is because it is such an interesting situation. Because, you know, if you were going to buy one practice, you know, then you don't know who the other person is going to buy the other practice. And you have to share that building with them for 10 plus years. Um, and then one of the practices is in decline, right? So it's kind of, a, yeah. you know, so-so. So the listing is technically two offices or is it one office? You know, they, they on the broker website it's listed as one listing but they the like the pro formas are two separate uh okay so two separate prices um so, you, so, so you so you can negotiate both prices separately i think interesting yeah so and you're so let's give the audience some you know i've looked at financials tyler's looked at financials you've looked at the financials but our audience mm -hmm. hasn't um so kind of give us a 10,000 foot overview of kind of the mm -hmm. financials on this office. 
Yeah. So they're, they're, you know, one doc is doing about 1.2 uh, million a year. He, that's the doc who's been there longer. He's, he's Delta premier. Um, so, you know, his, his fees are a little higher. The other doc is doing, I think last year it was around 860. I think it was um, prior when she first bought the office, it was really actually closer to a million. So pretty big decline um, in that part. Um, the numbers are pretty healthy, probably about 30. I think we saw 36% hygiene um, and just bread and butter dentistry. So pretty minimal marketing. Okay. And then the uh, plan doctor wise. So who's what's happening post transition? Yeah. So I really enjoy dentistry a lot more than my, sorry, what were you going to say? No, go ahead. Then my, Keep going. Uh, then my, then my fiance. Um, so I would like to think of myself as a really um, go getter in the production wise. So I feel like I would, and obviously, you know, I think she would take on better the female doctors. They're used to a female doctor. So she would take in those patients and then I would take on the, the male doctors patients and then just kind of go from there and, and grow the practice. Each doctor is only working three and a half days a week. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And, and you guys are pretty good with, you know, where this location is like, this is, you know, somewhere you could see yourself and your fiance living. Yeah. So I, I like the location as far as living goes, it's, it's right on the, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes away from a, a really desirable Metro uh, area. My really only biggest concern with this practice is because it's rural. Um, you know, I, I'm worried that I'm going to lock myself in in an area what maybe I can ever grow. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm okay reproducing what they've already been reproducing and maybe reprodu maybe produce a little more with some specialty procedures or, as George says, turning the knobs, right? But I'm that's really my biggest concern because it is a pretty big decision to, you know, you can't just move the practice. So you mentioned you're afraid of not being able to grow. Uh, are there aspects of the practice that you're referring to that you don't think there's there's ample opportunity for growth, or do you mean some other definition of growth there? Um, for me, what I've heard right on shared practices, you hear like like for example George's practice or other practices, that, you know, they grew practice model where they're getting like sixty to one hundred new patients a month, um, and spending a lot on advertising. Right, uh, you know. I just worry in a in a more like retirement rural community. I don't know that that that's a possibility, and and so I just I just wonder if you know I'm just going to be stuck at that level of production um, for the next ten fifteen years. Well, looking at the uh, marketing dollars that are being spent currently mm -hmm. and the new patient flow that you're seeing in these practices currently, how does that kind of measure up? Yeah, you know, I was actually surprised to see. Uh, they're really not spending a whole lot on marketing. Um, you know, I think maybe combined ten thousand dollars, and they're actually getting about thirty new patients a month. So that was surprising to me. Is that uh, total or each? Uh, total. They each on their pro forma say fifteen to twenty new patients a month. Obviously, that would have to be verified. But so but let's yeah. go back to. Um, I'm slapping myself. For you know, I just I saw a practice doing two million dollars in collections. It's not very often we get one of those on the show, so right. you know I got a little excited. Um, sure. Let's take a step back and let's talk vision. Okay, sure. So you know, let's go back to before we looked at this practice. You know, you're listening to our show. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're hearing stuff, ideas swirling through your mind. You have your fiance, hopefully one day wife. I'm guessing since mm -hmm. you call her fiance, right. um, you know. What do you want out of your career? What do you want out of your life? How does that relate to your practice? So I, I enjoy dentistry. I don't I don't necessarily think of myself as having to do the, the a lot of people say like the Justin Short model where you like you know are done and out in eight or ten years, whatever it may be. Um, I definitely know that I want at minimum five ops, six preferably, uh, just so that I if I wanted to I could you know bring an associate to babysit the practice if I were like away on vacation, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not really, I guess, sold one way or another versus like a, a six op versus a big group practice. To me, this practice just really seemed like a really good opportunity because we're both a dentist and, um, and it was, a you know, the, the income was going to be there and it's an area we want to live in. So you were not sold on the idea of practicing with your fiance until this opportunity that required two dentists came up like, oh, here, here's a dentist that I know, like we're living with and mm -hmm. you could potentially work with me. 
Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like yeah, we have to work together. We have worked together before, um, uh -huh. two days a week, and, and it worked out fine. Um, you know, I I think probably the only challenge wouldn't be so much working together in the office. It would just be me uh, not talking about work so much at home because I am so like into dentistry. Right. Yeah. So, so were you guys planning on working, you know, full time together all the time? And then you were going to maybe bring on another associate in case you guys were going on vacation. Is that what you were talking about? Or what was the idea with that? Uh, no, I was just saying like, if I was going to buy like a six op practice, like it'd be nice to have an associate to babysit the practice. If I ever wanted to take longer vacations, I worked in a practice that was seven ops also. And the, the doctor, you know, he would take like these month long vacations. Um, okay. and then it was nice for him. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the, the main draw to a larger group practice for you is, um, the possibility of having someone else babysit the practice while you're gone. Is that, that that's one of them yeah definitely how valid do you feel that is george how do you feel about that justification for group practice yeah i mean i'm kind of big on right i mean i'm big on everything group practice i think that's kind of obvious of course um, yeah i mean right and and matt he he comes from the standpoint of solos can take vacations too yes you can mm -hmm. um it's just we can take vacations while making money and um it's a very different type of vacation <laughs> when you check yeah. your pbn and you're like oh cool i'm still doing well um so yeah it's a little bit different but uh yes so i i right i mean i don't think there's anything i no. don't like about group practice that's the problem um so so here's uh, how many ops does this place have so it's seven seven ops um they have an old lab that they don't use anymore um so they said that that has everything that needs to be converted into an eighth op um so it's pretty good size. It's about, I think it's 3,000 square feet. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, he, he owns the building. Sorry. Is the so building he, for sale? So he said it's not for sale. He's pretty young, actually. He's only like 54. Um, and he said he would give option to buy. Um, first option to buy. So. First option. So first right of refusal or oh, yeah, first, option? Yeah, oh, yeah. First, yeah. The first right of refusal. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's shared with a, an endodontist and an oral surgeon. Oh, that changed things. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. the building has an endo and an oral surgeon and this office? Correct. Yeah. And he owns uh, the entire yeah. building or just this suite? Just the unit? Uh, so he and the other doctor that sold to the female doctor four years ago own each equally. Um, so she would then, she said that she would be able to transfer her whatever first right of refusal to me. So then you know, I can buy each half whenever they wanted to. So the building and the practice is actually pretty young. Uh, the, the, where they're at, it's only I think nine years old. So everything's it's pretty new. It's pretty nice. Okay, there's yeah. a couple things that I think. Right, there's been so many. There hasn't been so many of these episodes, but there there have been enough to. I want to harp on a few things about your deal that I think are unique. So one, we'll talk building. Mm -hmm. Two. Um, I want to talk about the new patient flow, rural concern, and lack of growth. Mm -hmm. um, but do you ever see yourself getting an associate in this place, like a full-time associate in addition to you and your fiance? Yeah. So my plan, honestly, was – so she – I mean, we have a we have a son. And, you know, this whole quarantine kind of made us – made realize how nice it was to be home with him. Um, yeah. If financially, if we could make it work, I wouldn't mind phasing her out to whatever she wanted. And then replacing her with an associate. Dude, I love this practice for you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like it. <laughs> I, I, like that's good to hear. I like. It. I don't see like I looked at this thing, and I'm like, yeah. Why are we not buying this like now? Okay. Um. <laughs> right. Staff costs a little high, but they're 36 percent hygiene, mm -hmm. so it's an underperforming doctor production. Uh, once doctor production improves and performs the way it should, then staff cost comes back in line not super concerned about it. Right. Um, and you don't really know what staff are being shared so that you could be counting two employees in the same, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, but I mean, I'm not ultra concerned about staff costs. Uh, I, I think I'll start with the, so the 30 new patients a month that they're mm -hmm. seeing, you know, right. you don't know what their capacity is. You don't know if they're not seeing new patients because they don't have capacity. You don't know. I mean, they're doing a lot of dentistry out of only seven ops and they're sharing it. I mean, I can't imagine that they're able to get people in quickly. Um, the other thing is 
you know, when you look at a practice, you can always, I, my guess is you could retain patients better than they could, right? You listen to our show, you try, you know what to do, like you should be able to retain people. And so with the same new patient flow, you can still have a larger practice than them through yeah. better retention. So you don't necessarily need more new patients if you just, you know, like in my practice, we had patients that would come in like once every two years for their cleaning. And now they come in every six months. I and see. that my practice is bigger, but it's the same number of people that consider us their dentist. It's just we're better at keeping them on time. So there's all of these things that you can do to grow the practice without increased new patient flow. But I also think increased new patient flow is on the table. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not... Honestly, I mean, I don't want to say it too quick, but I would like to just say, like, let's just proceed as if we're going to buy the thing. And let's talk about the rest of the episode of what you're going to do now that we're going to buy this thing. Okay, sure. Right. Yeah, like I, we're I talking $2 million dollars in collections, mm -hmm. uh, $1.5 million asking price, um, where you want to live, rural dentistry, bread and butter, 36% hygiene. Like, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing anything that I don't like. Um, <laughs> Tyler, I mean, uh, I know this isn't the typical sequence of an episode. We're 16 minutes in and I'm calling it. But like, I mean, I what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I kind of felt like that's where this was going to go. Um, <laughs> if you but, get me on with a practice doing $2 million yeah. in collections, I mean, it's going to yeah. be hard for me to not say that. Yeah. Top, top of tea, I got I to I gotta be kind of honest with you. You know, I, I brought him on and we were getting on a little bit early just to kind of go over the financials, make sure we're on the same page and everything. And he takes a gander and he's like, so why haven't we bought it yet? <laughs> you know, like, George, come on, we have to have an episode here. We have to have things to talk no, about. No, Tyler, he goes, he, he shoots me a message. He goes, Hey man, this is complicated. There's two dentists on here. Like they're they're working together. Like it'd be nice to have you on this one. And I thought, okay, cool. And normally I don't like looking at financials until we're on air and I like to do it all live. And we were here like a few minutes early and I popped up, like, yeah, why are we not buying this? This is super straightforward. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I want to talk building though. Sure. Yeah. So this thing has been on the market for how long? I know at least a year. I okay, and the seller thinks he has leverage to tell you no on the building? I mean, we it was just the I just went to see the practice. I don't know. I mean, it wasn't a Yeah, serious, right? Like, like he's of course offer. he doesn't want to sell you the building. Yeah. Of course. Um yeah. if there's anything to negotiate in this deal, mm -hmm. it is that. Right? Okay. Like your price, my terms. I always say that. Right, like okay. every time you've ever listened to a pre-ownership episode from George, I never say negotiate on price. Mm -hmm. Right, terms, building, biggest term in this deal. Period. Now here's why: you're gonna find out how much that building's worth. It's probably worth like mm -hmm. two million dollars, right. and you're gonna be paying rent in this space for the next as long as it'll take you to pay off the building. Mm -hmm. One way you do it, you know their price or whatever, your price, their terms, you don't own the building. 20 years from now, you're $2 million poorer. Um, my price, your terms, you give him the asking price he wants and you get the building you want. And then 20 years later, $2 million richer. Thank you, George, for the 2 million bucks. Um, I would not, like, this is not a situation where you got buyers crawling all over each other to own this practice for some reason, right? Like right. if I publicize where this was, I think it would go quickly. Um, but like you don't have people crawling over each other. Like you can you can negotiate. Mm -hmm. Um first pass, you try to get the building right off the bat. Second pass is a buy option. Say in five years, three years, something like that. Because mm -hmm. um, you're gonna you might have to have a hefty down payment on this building. So mm -hmm. say three years, give yourself some time to get rich and then and then buy the building. I would I not be good with a first right of refusal. Okay. Minimum I'd be okay with is a buy option. Because a buy option they can't say no to. You have the option to buy. It gets appraised, whatever it's appraised that you pay. Period. Mm. I see. Never that is that. yeah, that's ask me how I know. It's really frustrating not owning your real estate. Um yeah, I, extremely frustrating. And you have no freedom over what happens in your space, right? Let's just say you got eight ops right now. Mm -hmm. Let's just say George is right. And so all of a sudden you start seeing 60, 70 new patients a month. You have an associate. Maybe you want a second one. Maybe you want some more space. Well, if I don't own the building, I got no freedom, no flexibility, nothing. 
If I own the building, right. it's a lot better because now I have the ability to be in control of my destiny. Right. Um, you could kick out the endo. I don't know. Like I'm just I'm I'm not I'm just saying that you have you have a lot more options if you own that real estate. It's financially beneficial, more beneficial than you realize. Ask me how I know. Um, and you know, it's you, you like if you're going to negotiate on anything in this deal, real estate, period. Okay. Well, then on on that note, so the price of 1.5. So there, I don't know if you saw the listing price is actually closer to 1.7 something. Um, the the reason I put 1.5 is because the broker told me that the larger office he knows that I'm going to be switching to PPO and he's willing to take a, a big decrease. And I happen to maybe somehow know how much they might be willing to accept. Cool. Then offer that. I mean, that's so, very generous, but yeah. I'm, I'm saying don't, don't do that instead <laughs> yeah. of the building. Right. I see. Okay. Right. Like it, the, the seller needs to say, I've been having this practice on the market for a year. Nobody's bought it. They finally have this guy and I totally get why he would want the building. Like, and and I get that there's a partner in the building, and so it's like right. equally more complicated. But um, I would push very hard for the building. Okay. Right? And push comes to shove, and this is a – like you have time to do this. Right? And this doesn't sound like George. I get it. Right? George always says just get the practice. Cool. But this is not a situation where you have like five people lined up on this practice. You have time to get what you want. And the thing that I want you to have over anything else is the real estate. So you have some time to push. Say, I'd like mm -hmm. to own the building. Start there. Okay. Say, I want the practice, but I also want the building. Then that's not going to happen. Okay, give me a buy option. That doesn't happen. Okay, fine. I'll think about it. Then, it, then you buy the practice, right? <laughs> but like you still end up with the practice, but yeah. I, I think you'll end up with a buy option is my guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that was even a thing. So, thank you. Yeah, I got a buy option. Um, I pushed hard for the real estate. Didn't get it. Went for the buy option. Got it. Wish I had negotiated half as many years as I did. Yeah, I figure he probably thinks this is like part of his retirement, right? Yeah, like that's what they all think every, that. Payment every yeah. month. Payment every month. Get the, Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Sorry. Um, right? Like, cool. I know you want that, but like... You're not right. You don't have ten buyers lined up for your practice, dude. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your practice is also signed up with someone else's practice who's in decline, and you take Delta Premier. Like, you know, you see value in it mm -hmm. because you're smart, but not everyone does, and so you have the ability to negotiate. Right. You don't yeah. always get everything you want. What do you think about the decline? I mean, you know, I think it's like caveat emptor, right? You can always believe what the other person says. Do you just, I mean, profi wise, the patients are still. You know, yeah, I always look at number of profis. Profi number, um, yeah, yeah. Profi wise, there's about between the two, there's 20, 2,600 ish patients. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. Um, hygiene is thirty six percent. Like, yeah, you're gonna walk into this place and it's gonna grow overnight. Like okay. that's what's gonna happen. You're like, I'm a productive dentist. I'm like, yeah, okay. A lot of internal if, growth. Yeah, and I love the plan. So let's go back to the associate thing. Um, mm -hmm. Are any of these dentists willing to stay on as an associate? Um, well, her definitely not. She, she wants to be closer to, she's commuting pretty far right now. So she doesn't, um, I think he's pretty checked out. I don't know what, what would be your like kind of like a vision on that as far as having someone be on as an associate. Yeah. So I think sellers staying on as associates are great bridges to permanent associates. Mm -hmm. So it's, Right. If you want to, and I don't know if your fiance wants to go full in full time, but if she wants to stay at home with child, then mm -hmm. you guys, the three of you can work two full time dentist amount of hours versus um, you and her both working more and then getting an associate. So you I can see. sort of um, start with seller part time, you full time ish, fiance part time ish, and then get. Uh, full time associate, you cut back a little bit. Maybe fiance adjusts hours, and then now you're at like your dream scenario. But that mm -hmm. seller staying on allows you to sort of be in. A, I like sellers as like an associate bridge. 
Like they get you some extra doctor days. They let you grow mm-hmm. your hygiene department a little bit. And then they get you primed and ready. It's like um, training wheels. Like you put on the associate training wheels and then you, you eventually get a real one. Would there be a certain amount of like associate days that would not be worthwhile? Like if he was like, oh, okay, I'll do like two days a week. I don't care about his production. I care about his ability to check hygiene. Um, so no. Okay. Right. Cause if you think about it, um, if I have two dentists there, I can run more hygiene than if I have one. Mm-hmm. So two dentists with more hygienists, whether it's your fiance or the seller, I don't care who the second dentist is. So long as I can check that exam mm-hmm. so I can keep growing my hygiene department and get ready for an associate. That'd be the goal. I see. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So how does all that sit with you, Tapatio? How do you feel about this opportunity now? How does that change? Yeah. Well, yeah, I can tell you're kind of like overwhelmed. Well, so the problem is that with myself, I know I have this inherent flaw where I'm able to talk myself out of anything. Yeah, um, I can notice. I'm like, why are you talking yeah, about it? Like, it, the best thing ever. like, like uh, I don't know, just very cynical, I guess. So, you know, I I, I feel like relieved, I guess you could say, to know mm-hmm. that this, this practice has a, a stamp of approval. Because I really do like the practice. And that was really the only thing that was hanging me up. But I was thinking like, well, man, what if I, what if, I mean, yeah, what let's, if let's I, go through I, that. What's the worst thing that could happen? Patients leave. I can't produce what he was producing and I can't get new patients. I guess that was then my what? thought. Uh, figure out how to, how to produce with what I have and figure out how to market. So um, that, right, patients are going to leave, can't produce what they're going to produce. Is that any of that? situation dependent or is that just kind of a, a general fear you have about buying a practice so that that's just the, the general worry yeah general so fear. you can that fear has nothing to do with this opportunity right that's just fear right. you would have the same fear if it were yeah another opportunity. if it was if you were looking at like i honestly tyler how many practices have we looked at like i don't know a lot this is this is, this is probably, top five. yeah yeah, well, I would I put say it at, maybe five percent of the practices we look at. Yeah, I would say this is solid. This is really solid. Yeah. Um, if if you don't buy the practice, I mean, I I always say like, <laughs> I love that care. line. I think Hunter Smith was the first one that gave it that. And he's like, if you don't buy this practice, I will. Like, Me care. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like I won't. Um, I've uh sort of retracted in that department a little bit, but um, <laughs> you know if. If you don't buy that practice, I'm going to find someone else too. Yeah. Like, um, okay. <laughs> that fear you have, and right, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because you're experiencing this fear pre ownership, right? Fear of failure. Right. Mm-hmm. That's what it Pretty is. Pretty much. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your fear of failure is impacting the way you look at this practice. You are about to not buy this amazing practice yeah. because of fear of failure. Yeah. Now, as an owner, maybe you have a great associate candidate. Maybe you have that great opportunity to grow your practice with some type of investment, some type of marketing, some type of coaching, something. Fear of failure is also going to hold you back in those areas if you don't learn to recognize it and work through it. Right. And so my advice to you would be to use this as an opportunity to like really practice working through that fear of failure. Like the fear is there, but it's not, Mm -hmm. it's not like real, like it's not like because of anything real, it's just internal it's totally yeah. an internal thing yeah. and learning to recognize that and work through it will get you so much further in ownership than pretty much anything else i could have told you today george it sounds like that's something you personally resonate with did you possibly have some similar fear, fear of failure when you were um, for me it's not fear of failure so uh I, yeah I, I think so um tapatio <laughs> Yeah, I got I to gotta take you seriously while calling you that. Yeah. Uh, so, are you okay if we if we kind of diverge a little bit, or do oh, you yeah. want us to keep well, talking I'm, about this yeah. practice? No, because you're, mean, buying, you're buying I mean, the practice, but we still got like, some time left. You know that my only my only question <laughs> about the practice would then be: I mean, do we wait for any kind of like COVID? I mean, no, no, dude, move. Yeah, okay. go, okay. go. All right. Cha. Okay. No. Next subject. No. <laughs> we don't. We don't uh, talk right, about that. Right. By anymore. the time you get this thing wrapped up, it's going to be like three or four months. I see. That's when you'd be like, okay, COVID is like, I'm ready. I mean, right. I mean, what did they open up like a month ago? Um, 
Yeah, yeah. The the yeah. broker was gonna send me production reports every month. Yeah, and the bank will make sure of that for you. Like mm-hmm. get all your paperwork ironed out. Scream and shout about this building until you get it, and that'll take a couple months anyway. Just move forward, man. Okay. Yeah, that's my, the home, bank, that's my homework. The bank will be your COVID. Like, if the bank gives you money to buy it, then they're good with the COVID situation. Okay. Right? Let the bank be the one to worry about that. Don't worry about it. Um, no, but Tyler was talking about fear. So, mm-hmm. um, practice underwater. I tend to be very harsh on. Um, there's this upcoming guest. Probably by the time this is aired, her episode's already aired. Katie, and she just like lives her life in like this really fear based way of running her practice. And I just, I really think the number one way to run your practice like away from growth is mm-hmm. fear based decision making. And uh, we all have fear. And I think some people look at me and they're like, "Wow, dude, like, you know, you've got some guts." Um, but I'm um, trying to keep our feet clean. Um, so, you know, uh, but like. Um, it's been dirtier before. I don't know why you're concerned now, but go ahead. Uh, because I, so we released our new show, Dental Friends with Benefits. I was and, listening to it. Um, we have, we got an explicit rating on like I, the first, like every episode has an E next to it. And good. so uh, Richard's been terrified of our feet getting that. And so he's like, dude, okay. stop cussing on air because we're going to get an explicit rating. Um, mm. But anyway. Um, so people think I don't have fear, but like, I totally do just like you, right? It's, I think the skill is learning to identify it and learning to like put it down and do what you want to do anyway. And I think if, if you didn't have fear, you'd be like, oh my gosh, George, look at this practice. It's amazing. Like you'd love this. Um, but you're like, oh man, there's something wrong with this. Like I could fail. And like, there must be something in this practice that's going to lead to my inevitable failure. And so you're like looking for it. Um, so like learning to like, oh, that's just my fear talking. That's not real. Put it down and then carry on. That's the skill that you have the opportunity to gain pre-ownership that will help you a lot in ownership. Right. Right. And it's not necessarily a skill of programming that fear out of you. It's always going to be there. It's It's learning to recognize it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Once you can label it, like this is not real. That's the skill. Right. Yeah, no, I always always overanalyze and find like what's the worst possible thing that can happen and it's like a risk reward, but somehow the risk has so much weight to it, right? Yeah. Right. And like for this practice you definitely have to do due diligence. Right? Mm-hmm. Um like spend a couple grand, get it looked at and um make sure that you know you get it all taken care of mm-hmm. and like lean on your professionals, right? Lean on the bank for COVID. Lean yeah. on your due diligence person for, um, you know, the due diligence portion and, you know, blend these two. I mean, I'm assuming the plan is to blend these two practices into one, right? Like, right. Yeah. There's yeah. No patients so, like that, that'll whatever double names and all that stuff will go mm-hmm. away. And it's just one practice. Cool. Yep. Um, yeah, man. Like just lean on your professional help. And I mean, this practice cash flow is so well, like, wow. Wow. I'm excited for you, to be honest. This is a really great deal. And it's where you want to live. Like, yeah. that's hard to, that, and like, right? Work life balance, the fiance, kid. Like, dude, there's, be excited. there's a mountain. There's a mountain of things that yeah. are very likely going to go right here. Top yeah. of the Like, uh, you know, it's honestly hard happy. to mess this one up. Like, you have to really suck <laughs> it's, it's to make softball. this not work. Like, <laughs> I'd have you back on and roast you. Yeah. to the end if you don't make this one work man this is like this is this is like the easiest one i think i've ever seen to be honest yeah this is well, super straightforward well this is gonna be easy sell to the fiance then <laughs> yeah go. i mean of course this, this shouldn't even be an easy yeah right and i get i get it right like a large loan can be scary right cool i understand that um but i don't know i'd much rather have a lot of money and a large loan than not a lot of money and a small loan. So yeah, you'll come out on the, you'll come out on the good side of this for sure. Yeah. It wasn't even the loan that really scared I me. Mean, obviously the loan plays into it, but it was just the, I guess just thinking I, that I was going to have like one bad thing in the practice that I couldn't change, I guess. But yeah, I mean, like it's a non-issue. Acquisitions are weird like that though. There's a lot of quirky stuff like that lab op that becomes an op. Every yeah. time you walk in there, you're gonna be like, "This, this sucks. Like, why is it, this lab an op?" You know, but yeah, it worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I heard you say it once before that you said an acquisition is a basically like a calculated compromise. 
I yeah, think that, definitely. I think that works pretty well. Because before I, I hadn't heard you say that before, and I was like thinking like everything had to be exactly what you wanted. And I was like, nope. man, why not just do a startup? Um, <laughs> yeah, no. But, definitely but, not yeah. what you meant to infer. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> I'm going to scrap every tape of whatever I yeah. said that made people think that. We're, um, we're gonna have to <laughs> that. <laughs> That's going to be fun uh, for John. No, but, oh, no, John would hate me if I said that. Um, but like, <laughs> no, so... But let me explain that for our audience. Yeah. So, um, are you a golfer, Tapatio? No, I'm really into uh, cars. Cars. Okay. I don't know enough about cars to give you a good yeah. analogy. Okay. Um, but, like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to talk about golf. So, in golf, like, you think you're hitting a, like, everyone tries to hit a good shot, right? Like, you're trying to have a good acquisition where it has all the things that go well. But the reality is in golf, like, out of 10 shots, one of them is good and nine of them, there's some type of error. And so it's your job to make sure that the errors are in the right places. So in acquisitions, if we look at 10 deals, there's something wrong with all 10 of them. Right. It's just you got to pick the things that are wrong. So like, right, this practice is on decline, but we look at it, number of profits is okay. That's a good miss. We have um, two practices, a little quirky, uh, good miss, right? Easy to blend those two together. Not a big deal. Tons of patience. Um, we have... A rural environment, but you like it. So good miss, right? All the things that make this thing undesirable, they're kind of not bad. Like, right? Um, everyone has downsides. Like every, like, right? If, how many analogies you want to do? Dating analogy. There's so many like that you could use. Like there's always downsides to everything. These are just good downsides. They're not, they're not bad ones. Um, your facility costs are reasonable. You don't have anything that's like going to be a thorn in your side for the next 20 years other than not buying the building. Um, that to me is the biggest and right. And don't let fear of failure talk you out. Like, if, look, if, if you can't get the building, you still buy the practice. But um, it that would be the most annoying thing about this deal is never owning that real estate. Well, if that's the worst thing about this deal, sounds pretty good. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. Yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, this is, yeah, I think this is the best one I've looked at on TPO. Well, on air. Tyler, I can say that, right? Because I didn't look at that one that Matt looked at. It's, yeah, it's the best one that you've looked at. That's yeah, right. I think that one Matt looked at was equally as good. Um, yeah, it's yeah, not better. Very but, comparable. Very comparable. Yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, the, and I've looked at enough practices doing over $2 million a year in collections to know that they're not always this profitable. And they right. don't always have that high of a hygiene percentage. So yeah, it's funny right. because people always see like the, oh, well, I don't want to buy a $2 million practice because they're all maxed out. It's like this thing is 36% hygiene. It's as underperforming as the $400,000 office that you passed up on. Yeah. You know, it, this is a very underperforming $2 million practice and with low overhead. I don't get to say that ever. Like yeah. that combination of underperforming, low overhead, and $2 million plus revenue yeah. for not 100% of collections. Yeah. I think we're doing really, really good here. Um, you can you can ring that towel, Tapatio. Yeah. Well, well, I'm excited for you, honestly. Like you, an associate, fiance, uh, yeah, man, this is like layup. Yeah, what would you say is the the best growth model for this practice as far as like a uh, adding clinical? Um, like, do you think you know just being more active in diagnosing and treatment acceptance probably would do it, yeah. or do you think I need to go and you know start placing implants and molar endo? I mean. I would just do what you're comfortable with, you know, I mean, whatever that is. Um, yeah. Usually 36% hygiene isn't a procedure mix thing. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I would say like 28% hygiene okay. is more of a procedure mix thing. 36% hygiene is probably just a lot of patchy, you know, you're going to walk in there and see some stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was my guess. Well, or you're going to have a very low carries risk environment, but rural typically doesn't say that. Rural typically means patchy. So, um, you're going to have a more heavy doctor side practice than mine, for example. You know, mine's in a younger affluent area. Everyone is like, you know, I think my average income is like 110 k you know, young families with education, educated people. Like I don't have, I don't have like these bombed out mouths I look at all day. You know, you're going to have a lot more restorative need there. So you might get an associate faster than I would, and you might not need to check as much hygiene as I would. Um, but I would still, I think, I think you grow these both simultaneously, right? Like you grow the patient flow, you grow the hygiene department while simultaneously, 
um, co-diagnosing and working on, you know, financing options for your patients and all those things that drive restorative production. You sort of do both. Okay. And then efficiency, right? Like I'm sure there's a clinical efficiency not happening right now. Um, so. And you really work on that, uh, that fear. Yeah, for sure. Going on for sure. Um, yeah, and honestly, I mean, I'm looking at this practice and I think you're going to want more operatories faster than you realize. Yeah. Just saying it. Yeah. I know one of the days they, they have so many hygienists there that each doctor, uh, I think they said each doctor is only working out of one chair. Oh my gosh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so. should have said that. Have said that dude. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> if I wasn't already in love with this practice, so many hygienists, there's no room for the doctors. Oh God. Yeah. So, oh man, dude. Yeah. Buy this yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, okay. Yesterday. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, if you don't buy this, like at this point, that'd be dumb. Like after yeah. this interview, you know, <laughs> my thoughts on it, like you come on our show, we like, you better have a really good reason not to buy this thing. If you end up, not, you don't end up with it. Like seriously. Yourself, yeah. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. If, I'm going to follow up with you like on purpose in a few uh, months to make sure that you yeah. bought this thing. Well, this sounds like it should be the easiest decision of my life. Huh? It is literally yeah. easiest decision of your life. Period. Maybe the Thank best, you later. best yeah, decision no. after the fiance. Yeah. I'm not going to write those two, right? Like okay. they're very different. Um, <laughs> The easiest decision of my life. Yeah. Oh, geez. I didn't realize you said that. <laughs> she she may or might may not listen to this show. She thinks these kinds of shows are really boring. So, oh, me too. So that works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah. Well, do you have any questions about ownership? Um, because I think now, honestly, what I would like you to do is mm-hmm. buy this thing try to get the building, but everything else, like try to get AR, right? Like those are the terms I'd in order, right? Building accounts receivable. Um, so you like accounts receivable? Yes. Like just 30 day or just t- tier? All. Tier, tier, just tier. Okay. tier it. Yeah. Just whatever you can negotiate. Um, but just don't, it's such a hassle, such a hassle post sale fighting with sellers about accounts receivable. I don't understand why people insist on not buying the just buy the AR. Um, you know, right? Like get the get the reasonable right, like most brokers are pretty reasonable about the the like, you know, you don't pay a lot for over ninety and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But like just buy it. Don't deal with that all that crap. Um, because you're gonna have them arguing like, did any patients pay for this? And it's like, dude, just stop. Okay. Move on. Yeah. So I would do real estate, AR, um, and then purchase price in that order those would be the three things that I'd care about. Um, but I would really go hard for the real estate. Like first thing, like ass on fire, try to get that real estate. Okay. Hmm. So be willing to spend a lot of money in lawyer fees is what I'm hearing. Um, no, right. Like you don't have to so, fight with lawyers, right? Like just tell the broker, I, I want the building. Okay. Yeah, what, what does going hard mean to you, George? Like, that? like, am I putting that in the LOI? And then he says, no, like, no, I, I'm just telling the broker, like, Okay. Uh, I would call the broker and I would say, hey, um, look, I thought about it and this practice has a lot of red flags. Um, I'm, you know, a lot going on here, right? There's decline. We have Delta Premier. We have all this stuff. I'm willing to deal with all that, but like, I really need the building to make this worth my while. Um, The building is what I'm most excited about in this deal. So like, I'm willing to like take everything, the practice, I can make it work. I can kind of merge the two. It's a lot of hassle, but I can do it. Um, But I really, really want the building. That's going hard, right? Nice. And then you tell that to the seller, right? If, if this was off market, I sit down and say, look, there's a lot going on here. Um, I'm willing to make it work. I want to pay you a fair price in order for me to do that. Like the, I really need the building here. Like it's it's very important to me. And um, right. It is the most important thing to you in the deal. That needs to be communicated. Right? Okay. The building. And now the banks, they find they finance that. No problem then. Call your bank. Talk to them before you call the broker. Because <laughs> okay. if they're like, here, you can get the building. And then the bank's like, you need to put 20% down. You're like, well, I can't afford that. That it's like, oh, nope, no building. Yeah. Um, so make sure, your, make sure your bank is on board with. Um, <laughs> yeah, make sure you got the financing situation before you go um, pushing hard for the building. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like, and then if, right, but if you can't afford the building right now, if they require a down payment or whatever, then you just say, um, I want to buy option on the building in three years. Because in okay. three years, you should be able to afford the building. Right. 
Right. Okay. I will do that then. So I got. Yeah, and, I got... and you're going to get a lot of pushback on the building, um, because they know what I know. Like it's the most valuable part of the deal. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I mean... Most valuable thing: practice. Right. Like there's no way you can make that kind of income without it. Right. Um, second, building. I see. It's a net worth thing. Right. When you're all said and done, you're worth twice as much because you own the real estate. Right, like the seller who's going to sell this thing, I don't know what his cut is on his practice. Probably like a million bucks, maybe nine hundred, something like that. Um, but he owns more than that in equity on his real estate. So, I would like to be in that situation too. And now, you know, there's the other silent half of the building. I mean, the bank are they going to let me just buy half the building? Yeah, that's a deal specific thing. So I would. Um, right, like push for the whole thing, yeah, yeah, like you don't know what the other guy's doing, you yeah. don't know what's going on. I think he's uh, quite a bit older, yeah, he's quite a bit older, like maybe he's hitting social security age, you know, um, I don't know where he's at, but uh, right now, people are valuing uh liquid cash, you know, with covid they've you know they some people are liquidating, um, I don't know, feel them out, but uh, and this is this is where like I don't know, but I would like you to own as much of this whole real estate complex as possible, mm -hmm. right? In percentage, in everything, as like a hundred percent of the whole thing is best case scenario here. Um, then we work our way down, and I'm good with. And this is cool because no matter what, it's a good deal. Whether you own everything that the real estate has to offer, both both shares, like both of their pieces of the entire thing, or none of the real estate, you're still coming out ahead because you have this great practice. So you really you can't lose. Um, but this is the biggest place where you can win. All right. Ass on fire, push hard. Yeah. But don't make our feed explicit. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Richie. No. <laughs> I, I apologize. No, I, I'm like ordering mugs with that on it. We can't drop that catch. Yeah, right? I, I think sorry. because uh, – uh, Capitio, do you know what episode I'm talking about with with the, that? The, um, the startup, the startup guy. Yeah, right? the startup practice underwater guy. Yeah, what, what I think after I guy? after I did that, I was like, dude, why is your A not on fire? Like, what right. the heck? And then, <laughs> um, and then uh, they, I think some of the people in turn are like, let's get shirts with like ass on fire. Yeah. <laughs> You're showing up to BOD with ass on fire T-shirts. We are. That's, that's yeah, that's what they wanted to do. Want. Uh, yeah, I was amazed that he wasn't like panicking. He's like totally cool, calm, and collected. I'm like, dude, like this yeah. is this is not a cool. Co like, see, your situation very different than this, right? Like, right. That whole thing of like, oh, I should just do a startup. Yeah, okay. Um, this is this is a much better option, I think. Right. Uh, yeah, I 100 percent agree. Yeah, I mean, what is your take home post? Like, I think it's like 600 something post debt, right? uh from the two between the two of us yeah it's or higher like, like seven something yeah you know i mean i don't know if if uh it depends on how it looks for the bigger practice after you go to ppo because it's about it's about a hundred hundred thousand dollar decrease mm -hmm. um in collection yeah, but you're gonna increase practice. it with the um you can offset it yeah, yeah. with the how I much mean, hygiene it, they're doing like it, you'll it's gonna, yeah, it'll be. It, I mean, it's going to be better than a, a like a normal associate pay for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Find me the associate make it six hundred k, and then I'll yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah. this will be fun. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I have a oh. few things to talk to you about off air, um, sure. but on air, this was cool, man. Thanks for bringing this one to me. Sure. Well, um, I I'm so happy I got to just like increase, right? Everyone's concerned about the bias that I instill in our audience. And I'm so happy I got to like, you know, totally just make that 10 times worse this episode. I, I am super happy we got to talk because the, like the cynic in me was like really talking myself out of this. Like, what were you I saying? Mean, what was the cynic saying? Like, well, I was saying like, oh, you're good, like an idiot for buying a practice in a rural location and not having growth. And then, and there's like COVID. And the, I saw like Texas is going to close down again. I mean, you know, uh, which is that you're not in, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's also stuff uh, going around. You know, like cool. Yeah. Um, so. But like, but think about it though. This practice has been doing this type of revenue for the last twenty plus years. Right. Yeah. And it's been rural. Mm -hmm. um, so now that Tapatio owns it, it's not going to all of a sudden. Well, 
now we're all of a sudden rural. Let's start tanking. Right. Um, you know, right. the practice, like, it's it's stable. Like, yeah. if anything, it'll, I mean, yeah, I, I would honestly, I would say in three years, if this isn't doing $3 million a year in collections, and you're doing something wrong, to be honest. Really? Oh, well. Yeah. I was thinking we would be like at 2.8 for maximum. So that's great. The space, right? Space will be your yeah. issue. That's why I said you're going to want more operators. Um, but like in terms of potential, mm -hmm. this practice has everything you need to do three mil. It's just um, the space is going to be a problem. Well, that's great news. Yeah, yeah no, this, this whole thing is great news, dude. I love yeah. this practice. I, I cannot wait to see the cynic and you eating crow over this and you know, like <laughs> laughing at yourself forever at this point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think we're both very excited for you, to Agree. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tyler. I really I really uh what is, are you concerned about the bias now? I mean, I know I know people are uh Tapatio, from your perspective, is the bias strong coming from my mouth about group practice? Um I mean, I think there's an obvious bias, but I think it's for good reason, to be honest. I just am no. passionate about things I believe in. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to walk away from that or change. It just, it just comes out. I don't know. It, yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, the bias is. I think it's well appointed because in this area, the demographics anywhere else in the city are are terrible. To do a startup and to get to this level would take, I don't know, who knows how long. Right. Yeah. So. All right, well, Tyler, I'll let you close it off. Yeah. I totally hijacked your show this episode. I'm sorry, I just can't even hold back. I love this practice. You know, um, believe me, I, uh, I'm i not under any illusions whenever I send a potential group practice uh, George Reary's way. So um, I knew this was going to be a late interview and I probably needed some hijacking. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, this is 1 a.m. Tyler's time right now. So. It is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a trooper. He let yeah. me put my kids to sleep and then do this. So I appreciated that. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was the hero today. But um it's up to you. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate this opportunity you sent our way. Um, you know, I think we did a lot with what was truly a slam dunk opportunity. Um, but we touched on some really good stuff, you know. Um, we touched on, you know, the real estate, you know, being as big of an issue as it is and you know, going really hard on that and the potential um, you know, windfall for you um down the road with that. But also we touched on, you know, what obstacles that you've managed to put in your way. Um even with a, a near perfect uh, calculated, uh, uh, what, what, what do we call it? Sorry. It's a calculated compromise. That's correct. Right. right. Well, calculated, calculated compromise. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's yeah, what that's great. you yeah. put in front of yourself. So, uh, you know, I think that's probably grounds for an episode in and of itself. But um, personally, I don't know if I could hold on for another hour. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, Tabatio, thank you so much. And I absolutely want to follow up with you on this and see how it goes. Um, so, again, just thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, we'll be on again next week, and I hope you guys all enjoy the episode.